Um, I am especially pleased and honored to be introducing the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Somaliland, Dr. Mohammed Abdullah Abduhali Omar. Um, he and I have had the chance to meet before in Somaliland, I'm pleased to say. And uh, I'm also pleased to say I told him that we, here at IRI, we work in about 55 countries, and we always say there are four or five that steal your heart. Um, and Somaliland, for me, has become one of them. And the reason is because of the tremendous achievements of Somaliland over these past, especially 10, 12 years, um, both in terms of economics, in terms of building up their country, and in terms of the politics. I was saying that when you go to Hargeisa Airport, uh, in one of the waiting rooms is a picture, a map, and on the map is a picture of Hargeisa in the mid-1990s, and it looks like Dresden. And today you are hard-pressed to find any evidence that there was ever any fighting in Hargeisa. Everything has been completely rebuilt. Um, the economy um, is moving ahead, mainly agricultural but they're doing a very fine job. What impressed us most, being in the democracy business, was the conduct of the elections. Um, amongst many other things that we praised was a program to involve uh, college kids in the elections. They, they, the University of Hargeisa and other universities had uh, young, mainly young women, I have to say, at each, almost every polling place. And in many places, they were the chairs of the polling places. And they were very conscientious on election day, especially at turning away those who were trying to vote young people, very young people, um, who really should not have been in voting. But that was quite something to see. Most impressive, and Peter remarked upon this, Peter found, was after the election how orderly the transfer of power from an incumbent to a challenger was. And that is something that we at IRI wish we saw in many, many more countries. So we at IRI have become big fans of Somaliland. We, as I said, are very honored to welcome the foreign minister here. Peter Pham, who's an old friend of IRI, is going to do the uh, formal introduction. Peter comes to us from the Atlantic Council, where he is head of their new center on Africa. Previously, he was with the National Committee on American Foreign Policy in New York. He's also taught at the Nelson Institute at James Madison University and served, I'm pleased to say, as a senior advisor on Africa to Senator John McCain's campaign in 2008. He is a much published writer, as you all no doubt know, and he also serves on the advisory group of AFRICOM. Peter, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Lauren, for the introduction, and thank you to IRI for not only hosting this forum uh, for the foreign minister of the Republic of Somaliland, but really for the long-term engagement that IRI has done in Somaliland uh, with uh, help to the political parties, monitoring the uh, presidential and legislative elections, and then, of course, the presidential election last year that uh, I was privileged to be part of the IRI team observing. Um, if I can permit a word since... Uh, I don't speak for IRI, a little partisan uh, commentary. In addition to the wonderful transition that Somaliland has given us, uh, I think we ought to start sending congressional delegations to Somaliland to learn about fiscal policy. Uh, the administration that the foreign minister serves in actually proved that you can triple government revenue by slashing by more than half the uh, percentage of the income tax. Uh, uh, they cut it from 28% down to 12 and tripled their collections and now provide universal free elementary education for students. So maybe there's something to be learned in that as well. Uh, but it's a real pleasure to just introduce uh, uh, Mohammed Abdullahi Omar, the for Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation for Somaliland. He was appointed last July uh, after Mohammed, uh, Ahmed Mohammed Mohammed uh, Solano of uh, the Peace, Unity, and Development, the Comilla Party, was elected president in that country's election. Dr. Omar was previously the foreign affairs advisor to the Comilla Party for several years, where he articulated its foreign policy strategy. 
He's a graduate of the University of Nottingham with an MA in Urban Policy and earned his PhD from the University of Birmingham. He's taught at the University of Brunel in the UK, as well as the Institute for Education at the University of London. Prior to his work uh, in the politics of Somaliland, he was also a senior education policy advisor to the Birmingham City Council. Uh, he's published on a wide variety of topics, including democracy, current events, strategic relations, and presented a number of papers. And I think it's a real treat and an honor for us to uh, hear him on the latest developments in Somaliland as well as in that critical region of the Horn. Uh, Minister. Thank you very much, Peter, for that um, introduction. Um, it is a great pleasure uh, for me as a, a, a foreign minister of the government of Somaliland to be here today and to speak to such a distinguished uh, guest. Um, I'm not going to bore you about um, a lot of historical and, and political process for Somaliland. I'm aware a lot of you are uh, well informed about the history uh, of Somaliland. But what I want to, to highlight in a few minutes is about uh, Somaliland's progress, Somaliland's challenges, and Somaliland's views about the way forward for us and also for the region, because we are a part of a broader region that is in, in turmoil at the moment. Um, Somaliland has a functioning democracy. Um, we have, um, as you are all aware, a, a government uh, that has been directly elected by the people of Somalia. We have a parliament that is elected um, and kept accountable um, by, the, by the people of Somalia. Um, in fact, we have had a, lot of, a couple of successful elections, parliament, parliamentary elections, presidential elections, and local council uh, elections. Uh, but we also have had a peaceful transfer of power from a losing uh, party uh, to a winning party. Um, and I wanted to give here a tribute to the previous government of Somaliland uh, for the way in which they have handed over the power to the, uh, my party who won uh, elections last year. That's a credit to the people of Somaliland and that's a consistent pattern in the political uh, behavior of the people of Somaliland. The question is what, what uh, made Somaliland so distinctive uh, from, from Somalia? in the way that the Somali political affairs have been played out uh, over the last uh, two, two decades. I think one of the key, key um, uh, issues here uh, are um, the SNM, this, the former Somali national movement that has liberated uh, Somaliland from the former regime of Siad Barre, has been very effective and very clear about their ideas. Uh, and when the, um, the, the former Somali state collapsed in 1991. Um, SNM was clearly the, the leaders in Somaliland, and, and they have um, uh, been able to manage the aspirations of the people of Somaliland and, 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 and deliver, deliver on a number of important objectives they had. Um, but that was not possible in Somalia. Uh, when the former regime uh, left and has, has been uh, defeated, um, there were too many groups in, in Somalia, uh, and there wasn't a clear victor in, in Somali political uh, affairs. You had a number of competing political groups, often armed groups, um, uh, and they were unable to, um, to manage their differences, and there wasn't a clear winner. And then you have, from there, Somalia has never been stable. You have uh, warlords after that who were running the the, the affairs in, in, in Somalia. And now you have got radical groups, Islamists, Al-Shabaab, um, that make, uh, that have a full control of the bulk of Somalia. Unfortunately, Somalia has never had a stable period of time for the last 20 years. I think one of the key um, uh, um, uh, issues that made uh, Somaliland to succeed is apart from having one political group, SNM, is also the idea that Somalilanders want to have a, a form, a state nation, a, a nation state. We were all united to um, have our own uh, nation state. 
we were all committed to that broader, to that objective and goal that we all subscribe to. Uh, having a, a well-defined goal helps uh, for people to, to be united and to work together. That was another issue which made Somaliland uh, become peaceful and stable and democratic. Um, but also the, um, the approach we have taken for our conflict resolution and peace building and state building was a bottom-up approach whereby people had equal access to that process from 1991 uh, to up to now. And that bottom-up approach, um, which involves a less international involvement, has actually been very helpful for the people of Somalia. But in Somalia, the, the, the peace process has been, and I, I think to some extent it still is, a, 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 a product of an international ideas, international interventions, international views. And, and the political class in Mogadishu has been negatively rewarded for quite a long time. They have been allowed to continue with their administration, uh, despite the fact that actually they haven't delivered. Uh, until I give you an example, that current TFG was formed in Kenya in 2004. That's more than six years. Uh, one of the key uh, tasks they have been given was to deliver what the international community uh, described as transitional tasks. And one of the uh, main tasks was to engage a reconciliation process among all the political stakeholders in Somalia. They haven't achieved um, uh, that, that task up until now. Another task was to um, uh, uh, draft a, a constitution that is acceptable uh, to all, all Somalis. Uh, that's not been uh, achieved. Uh, another task was to have, um, at the end of the transition, which was meant to be four years, to have an elected government at the end of that process. We are now more than six years, and, and Somalia is far from having a, a democratic reform, political parties, and, and elections. Yet the international community kept rewarding the TFG. They just had another year of extension. Uh, and this time, uh, the international community has become very tough uh, uh, and become very vocal and very critical of the TFG, and they want TFG to deliver all those tasks that was expecting of them over six months, six years, to deliver in 10 or 11 months. I don't think that's realistic. Um, I don't think that's achievable either. Uh, but it shows you that there is no vision, there is no ideas, and there is no uh, um, commitment from the Somali political actors um, in, in moving the Somali question forward. But that, that's the distinction. Um, and I, I just talked about what made Somaliland uh, possible. I think it's the idea of forming a, a nation state, the idea that they want to uh, behave uh, 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 as a country, <coughs> act as a country, and work as a country has been demonstrated over and over by having a free and fair election, by, uh, uh, by broadening the political uh, space for, for people of Somaliland, and by working with the international community on a number of issues. Another subject I want to touch upon is the, the, the role that Somalian government takes in the, in the regional and international uh, affairs. Somalian is a part of solution when you talk about the war on terror. Uh, we have been very active in, in fighting against uh, terrorists. Al-Shabaab has indeed attacked Somalian a, a, a couple of times. The last time was in 2008, October 2008, when uh, Somalian's presidential palace and a number of key foreign offices uh, in, in Hargeza had been, a bit, has been attacked by, by terrorists. And a lot of people have lost their lives. Um, the reason why Somaliland has been attacked and is still under threat from al-Shabaab um, is mainly because the values that we stand for, the values of democracy, equality, and the rule of law. Al-Shabaab and other terrorists do not think democracy is, is the best way to manage a country. They actually think it's an alien uh, values that we, Somaliland, as predominantly a Muslim country, shouldn't actually adopt. Uh, but our people, our government, and our community are fully committed to promoting democracy. And I'm glad that IRA has, been, uh, has witnessed it, that democratic reform. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you um, in Somaliland during our elections. Uh, but also, and many other times, working with us in promoting democracy, but also uh, providing uh, vital services for, for our people. Another reason why we have been uh, attacked is 
because of the relationship we have with the, with the uh, democratic states like the United States of gov government, other beast loving nations on the earth, um, and, 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 and the Somalian's ambition to become a nation state that is a, um, taking a, a, an important role in, in the war against piracy, war against terror, hasn't been welcomed by terrorists in the region. Um, one of the key developments um, uh, for the last year since uh, this government is the idea of linking up with the international community much more effectively than we have ever done before. We have adopted what we call uh, a, a pragmatic foreign policy, which in a, in a nutshell uh, sets out that yes, we are recognition is and will always remain a goal for, for the people of Somalia. My government is committed working on that and trying to convince uh, many members of the international community to recognize politically uh, government and the people of Somalia. But we also, uh, we also adding other foreign policy objectives on table. A foreign policy uh, recognition is a key and a goal, but we want to cooperate and work with the international community on a range of issues, on economic development, for example. We think if we can deliver uh, if we can create jobs and opportunities for our young people, for our people, that will consolidate our governance. It will help our sustainability as a government. And that is going to make us sustainable. That, that will help us to sustain the achievements that we have made so far. Achievements in democracy, achievements in peace and stability, rule of law, development of the private sector and the civil society. These are vital, vital achievements that Somalia have achieved by and large on our own. We need to sustain those. That, that, that's our priority. And in order to sustain those achievements, we need to cooperate much more effective and imaginative in a way that we have never done before with the international community. So yes, we will be seeking for recognition, but that will not stop us working effectively uh, with the international community, Britain, UK, EU, Arab states and African countries, because we, we have a key interest in sustaining those achievements. For that matter, our current government is actively looking for international investment. I have, uh, as a part of a broader team uh, led by our president, have been to Hong Kong, China recently. Um, one of the reasons we went there is to see whether we can have a, 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 an economic development cooperation with China. Um, we, we were looking for opportunities where um, we could have an investment in our infrastructure, roads, uh, hospitals, portis, those key elements which we hope will provide us jobs and provide us security and provide us wealth is our, our, is our priority. We're also working with, with the West in the war against terror because we think that's a, a, a common interest for us and for the other people. Otherwise, we will not be able to achieve the objectives that we have uh, achieved. We also work with the international community on the war against, against piracy. Piracy has been very active in the region that we are part of. I have to say that uh, Somalia has taken a, a key role in the fight against piracy. We have uh, achieved, we have uh, arrested um, as many as 90 pirates who have been committing a act of uh, pirate crimes in our international territorial waters. And they are currently serving uh, prison sentences, uh, most of them in Somalia. This is unique in a, in a, in a context where uh, piracy is actually involved in the economic means of Somalia, particularly regions of Somalia like Puntland. But we have uh, able to deny pirates to have bases on the ground in Somalia. And we think that's the most effective way of dealing with, pir with piracy, is to deny them to have bases, let alone to the, their economy to be integrated with the normal economy. And that's something which we, we have achieved, and some, something we are calling on for Somalia and uh, in particular Puntland to, um, uh, because that's where the, the, the bulk of pir pirates come. In fact, all the nine, 90 pirates, none is from Somalia uh, who are in prison. All are from, mainly from Puntland region, but other regions of Somalia too. So we are calling on Somalia to be more effective and to deny uh, uh, pirates and the pirate activities on the ground in their territory. The dual uh, track approach uh, introduced by the United States government has offered us a renewed, given us a new opportunity. Um, this has meant that the international community um, will, of course, focus on Somalia 
uh, because of the problems that Somalia presents. But that will not stop, according to um, the uh, dual track uh, policy, working with Somalia. In other words, rewarding positive pro progress, democracy, peace, and stability. Um, so that's a, a policy which we embrace and we welcome that policy. Uh, but we would like that policy to become a more clearer and more concrete in relation to uh, what we could expect in, in Somaliland from, from the United States government and from other friendly governments that is increasingly appro uh, applying that dual track approach. But I have to mention here, and we are very pleased with that, that uh, for the last year the international engagement has increased to Somaliland. We have had a number of uh, high-profile visitors and visitors from, from the West, including ministers, foreign ministers, uh, um, international development ministers, um, uh, people from uh, Britain, Denmark, Norway. We have had a high-level delegation from USID in Somalia, in a way that we never had before. So we think that tour track policy is, has already started delivering. Uh, we want to have more substance of that in terms of increased development aid, increased cooperation in the fight against piracy, increased assistance in the fight and cooperation in the fight against uh, terrorism. And we would also like to um, be supported to access international and regional forums where security and political issues that affect us are being discussed. I know the Security Council gets a regular report on Somalia. Uh, we would like uh, for the UN Security Council to get regular reports about Somaliland too, because we present an alternative and we present a positive um, a contribution to the region and we would like to, uh, to Somaliland to be reported on, on a regular basis at the UN Security Council briefings. A, a final thought about our view about Somalia. Um, we um, have uh, an interest in stable Somalia and secure Somalia. After all, uh, that's where the majority of insecurity in our country comes from. Piracy comes from Somalia to us. Pirate problem is caused by pir pir pirates. Terrorism and Al-Shabaab and all that stuff originates mainly from Somalia, and we are being affected by, by that problem. So we have a key interest uh, in, 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 bringing Somalia, in bringing security and stability back into Somalia. And therefore, we are very supportive of the efforts by the international community with that regard. But we think the approach has been too long from a, a top down. I think it, it, the international community should make the TFG accountable for, for what they are doing for, for the people of Somalia. Uh, but we are very supportive about, about that approach. We think that a, uh, Somaliland has a role to play uh, in bringing peace and stability. And therefore, we would like to be given an opportunity to express our views, to share our experience of state building and peace building and reconciliation in regional and international forums. You have what the uh, international community call ICG conferences, international contact groups. I know that those conferences have not been very effective in, in terms of delivering uh, uh, peace and stability, but Somaliland can provide a, um, a, a can share experience. It is our experience uh, in forums like that. And therefore we would, we would like to be um, able to access those forums in order to, be, uh, to, to play an active role in the regional affairs that affect us. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm quite happy to take on questions afterwards. Thank you. Uh, before uh, opening it up to questions, I'm sure there are going to be quite a number uh, of questions, especially on current events and the quest for recognition. If I can exercise the moderator's uh, prerogative to, to ask a first question that looks a little bit backward, because I think looking at where you've come from and the decisions that Somaliland's leaders have made, one really has to acknowledge that some of them were visionary decisions that contain lessons learned, I think, for other transitions. Uh, I think understated, I think, was the decision of the Somali national movement to put itself out of business 
rather than continue as a, a governing party, which is unprecedented in the African context where part of the problem is revolutionary liberation movements that become ruling parties that don't want to go off the scene. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that decision process, because you were involved, and certainly President Solano, how you made these decisions which seemed haphazard at the time, but now are paying very rich dividends in the political culture. Sorry. The, the SNM, the Somali National Movement, the, 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 the main purpose for the SNM was to free the people of Somaliland. The purpose was not to get offices for them, to, to, to lead the country or to, to compete uh, power. The primary preoccupation was to free uh, the people of, of Somaliland from the, the former regime of Siad Barre, because they felt that the, the citizens in Somaliland have been uh, treated as a second citizens. They have not been given an equal access to natural resources, equal access to education, health, and wealth. And therefore, they think they have accomplished it their job once they have freed uh, the people of Somalia. And they have opened the political space for everyone to participate and to think with them about how to go forward. And one of the key uh, beaters is absolutely right. Um, uh, decision, important decisions they made was to, re, to um, uh, relinquish power to a, a, another a group that was seen as uh, to be more inclusive in terms of the different constituencies uh, in, in Somalia, but also to have uh, the courage and the leadership that the people of Somalia required at that time. And that decision will still re will remain historic in the history. The current president, uh, Ahmed Mohamed Silayo, was the longest leader of the uh, the leader with the longest period uh, during the SNM, and he was leading that process, and he was one of the key influential people who have made those decisions to be to be uh, uh, possible to those decisions to be made at the time in 1991. Uh, the minister now take questions if you would. Uh, I think there are microphones. If you would identify yourself and uh, when you uh, introduce your question. Uh, welcome, Minister. Uh, Tony Carroll, uh, Manchester Trade, and I'm an adjunct faculty member of Johns Hopkins uh, University. Um, I'm wondering what do the Africa Union leadership or members tell you? I think with the perhaps one of the unforeseen consequences of the departure of both Thabo Mbeki and President Obasanjo, in Nigeria, it seems that two of the African, most prominent African leaders who are inclined to have a serious discussion about independence of Somaliland are no longer on the continent's political scene. So I'm wondering if you are getting much receptivity uh, from um, African Union leadership, other African heads of state, on the issue of, of sovereignty. Um, just I'm wondering if that conversation has changed within the last two years. I uh, certainly hope that the, uh, the attitude of the African Union would change uh, in, the, in, the, in the next uh, um, year or two or whatever. Um, more so because of the, 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 uh, the uh, Southern Sudan case, which has uh, become independent this year and has been well embraced uh, by, African, by African countries. We think that will, even though the case of South Sudan is not, is not the same case as Somalia. As Somalia. You have a stronger case than I but, but Absolutely. We, we, we have a very stronger case than South Sudan. Uh, we had, um, had our own independence. We have been an independent state before. We're not talking about secession. Uh, in Somaliland. We're talking about a dissolution of a union, a union that we went on on a voluntary basis, a union which we don't think it was actually rectified legally. So it, this is not, it is not a legal case that is taking us back or, or stopping us from having a recognition. It is actually a political will. Uh, and, and political will are uh, decision, political decisions are made by member states, not the African Union as an institution. So we hope that um, uh, given our uh, uh, um, uh, consistent in peace building and stability and democracy, uh, given our uh, um, current economic position that we are attracting international investment, given that the dual uh, uh, track approach and other approach are giving us an access 
to the international community, we hope we will be able to convince um, African states to realize uh, that it is actually in the benefit of the region and Africa that Somaliland uh, gets its international recognition. We hope that South Africa, um, who, uh, that has been uh, a friendly country, I would, I would call them, to Somaliland, will continue to do so. But we also have got other friends. Somaliland is not actually isolated. We have many friends in the world, in Africa, in America, in Europe, and, and we, we count on those friends. And we think that a, a one day the Somalian government and people will, 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 will hear a positive response in relation to recognition. Dr. Murphy. Um, Martin Murphy from the Atlantic Council. A foreign minister, thank you very much for your remarks. Could you brief us on why the position is now in the border dispute uh, with Puntland? You know what is what is going on, and how you envisage that dispute being resolved. And also, what are your fears about that as that, that area is a haven for disruptive disruptive actors? Um, the uh, issue between Somaliland and and, and Puntland <coughs> is about people who um, ethnically or in terms of clan related to the Puntland, but they are they live traditionally in Somaliland. So we're talking about a, a, a district is, that is within Somaliland, but it's inhabited by people who ethnically related to Puntland people. That, that's, that's the basis of, of the issue. Puntland, uh, we can understand that Puntland wants for those people to be treated well, to be integrated into the system, which, which is what Somaliland wants. Um, but um, we have been engaging with, the, with, the, with those communities in, in those regions. And, and the, the President Silayo has offered a peaceful uh, reconciliation process for the people. And they have been engaging um, well with, with our government. And as a result of that, like the conference of Woodward, which was this year, has provided a lot of um, opportunity for uh, people on, on both sides to discuss about resolving those issues in a peaceful way. We don't actually think Buntland and Somalia will go into war. On, on that issue. We really don't think, and definitely that's not the intention of my government. We think we can resolve those uh, uh, issues peacefully. It is about people who, who are part of Somaliland, but ethnically related to, um, to Buntaland. Uh, we think we have people in Ethiopia who are ethnically related to us, and we have people who live in Kenya that are ethnically related to Somaliland. We're not laying claims on, on those uh, territories, and, and we think that Puntland will realize that they will not. Uh, it will not be wise for them to um, lay a claim on parts of, of Somaliland. But we are ho we are happy to discuss with them on if there are any other issues, because we can cooperate on security, on lack of security. We can cooperate on piracy. There are so many other issues we can talk and discuss. But there is another dimension to this problem, which is about a group called SSC. Um, this is a group of uh, mainly from the diaspora, and in fact mainly from, from the United States of America, who are actually um, uh, having a cause for concern for both of us, for Puntland and Somaliland, but also increasingly for Ethiopia. Uh, we, we think this group have links with the um, uh, radical groups in the region. They have been bringing weapons and arms into the the border between Puntland and Somaliland, and they have been attacking and killing some citizens uh, in the region. Uh, and we are currently cooperating with a um, number of other uh, governments in the region um, in order to have a common approach of dealing with SSC. So these things are distinctive. We are, we are engaged in a peaceful negotiation with Puntland on any issues they, they, they feel that needs to be discussed. We are talking with our people in our country that feel that ethnic related to the Puntland, uh, but we don't want to, to talk to the SSC. Uh, we want to cooperate with other countries in, 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 in a way that we can effectively eliminate or reduce the risk that they are posing currently to us. Mr. Minister, thanks for being here. My name is Maureen Farrell. I'm with Booz Allen Hamilton, but I'm doing research on behalf of U.S. Africa Command. My question to you is, um, 
Regarding your comment about in Somaliland's many international partners, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about some of the international cooperation in the security sector. If you, have, if your friends in the Arab League, um, perhaps in Europe, in the UK, are possibly providing military assistance. Thank you. Um, I think you, you would uh, know that there is an uh, arms embargo on the region, um, which um, involves also Somaliland. Um, I know there has been uh, 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 violations of that UN security resolution, uh, but because of that, um, Somaliland has not been able to uh, build or train or develop the security sector, particularly the, the military. Um, so that, that's, in, that's a problem for us, because we want to be better prepared to defend ourselves against piracy, better prepare ourselves against, or defend, I would say, against international terrorists that are actively uh, uh, trying to attack us. Uh, but because of the UN security uh, resolution, which bans um, arms embargo in the region, we are not able to become an active partner in the fight against terrorism, in the fight against piracy. Uh, but for police training, we have been increasingly being supported by uh, a number of countries. Uh, which we consider as friendly countries, including Britain. Um, we have been able to train our police um, and, and our uh, coastal guards uh, that uh, have been very effective in, 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 the, in, in defending ourselves from, from, from pirates. Um, so we have a, America and, and, and the Britain and other countries are our uh, useful partners in the security sector. We share intelligence information about terrorism. Uh, we jointly uh, undertake operations against terrorism in the region. So we have partners, but unfortunately we are not able to develop our security service as well as we wanted because of that UN Security Council resolution. But we are working on, on getting some uh, um, relief of that uh, with the help of some friendly countries. Yes. Um. During the, the, the current crisis that's going on, especially in South Central, with the famine, how has Somaliland 1 fared in, in the overall crisis, and what has Somaliland done um, in helping alleviate any of the, the issues that are, that are going on? Is it possible? Is there any cooperation um, with the, the TFG or other uh, aid agencies, or is there, ma is there a massive influx of, of refugees into Somaliland? I'm just wondering what what, from your perspective, how Somaliland is being impacted by this and what you're doing about it? Um, Somaliland has been affected, uh, affected by, the, by the drought. Um, because this, is, this was a, a, a regional uh, famine, it is not only uh, limited to Somalia. But, and as a result of that, a lot of people are suffering. In fact, um, we, this week we produced a report which uh, clearly states that around one million uh, people in Somaliland, and mainly um, um, nomadic, uh, and f and nomadic uh, uh, people and, and, and farmers, have lost their livestock. Um, and as a result of that, they are at risk of, 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 of um, becoming a victims of drought and, um, and, and, and famine. Um, but what made uh, 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 what, made, what, what, was, what makes it different, Somaliland from Somalia, in the way we manage uh, drought? Because there has been a lot of uh, more people who have died in Somalia from droughts than in Somalia. Much more people. I think what made is, is the governance. Uh, we have been able to, um, and we are still able to work with the aid agencies uh, to reach out uh, those people that have been affected by, by the drought, even though we are still have to get more assistance. But the assistance that government, my government has been able to deliver uh, have actually reached the, the places where we need to reach. Uh, in Somalia, uh, the TFG, unfortunately, is in the grip of Al-Shabaab, because Al-Shabaab controls the most of Somalia. And they resisted to allowing uh, a, um, international aid agencies to provide a humanitarian assistance to the people who, who need in Somalia. And that's why a lot of people uh, died before aid uh, reaches them, reach them. So that, that's the difference. But we have been affected and we are actually sending uh, bills to the international community uh, for assistance, for humanitarian assistance uh, to Somaliland. Because we think um, the, the, there has been too much focus, and rightly so, on Somalia, in, even in relation to the famine. But the people of Somaliland have been affected too. And we expect 
that the USAID and other uh, development agencies, international humanitarian agencies, would uh, um, um, provide uh, an emergence and humanitarian assistance to Somaliland in order to reduce the risk posed by the drought on many Somalilanders. Hi, and thank you for being here today. My name is Julie Mancuso. I work for the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, you've mentioned um, a little bit about your uh, kind of growth strategy for seeking um, foreign investment. Um, I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit more about internally what's happening on the ground with the local private sector and um, opportunities there, whether it be with the Chamber of Commerce or um, SMEs. Um, what sort of the growth strategy is internally. Thank you. Thanks. Um, the, uh, the FDI, the foreign direct investment, is what we are looking for. Uh, but we're also interested to um, have um, international companies and governments that are willing to uh, invest basically in our natural resources. So we will have an add, we will add into added value to those resources and then and, um, um, provide jobs and, and wealth for, for our government and for our people. So we are constantly welcoming anyone who is interested in investing Somalia. I understand uh, in the current climate of lack of recognition, a lot of people are, are not, do not feel comfortable in investing. But what we are uh, telling uh, uh, those investors is that Somaliland's stability um, uh, and, and, and security over the last 20 years uh, should be taken into our consideration for a future investment. And we have an investment uh, policy and investment laws which would provide a lucrative um, opportunities for investors, uh, including um, uh, tax uh, relief is, but also encouraging uh, 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 investors to invest in, in natural resources, which will provide a win-win situation over the long term uh, for all uh, partners involved. Uh, in relation to the private sector, that's what work, what's working for Somaliland most. The government is small. We have opted for a small government and a big uh, uh, private sector and, 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 and civil society. Um, one of the um, main employers in my country are, are the public sector, uh, the, the private sector, particularly the business. The telecommunication sector employs a, a lot of people in Somalia, and we have one of the most cheapest telecommunication services in, 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 in the region. Um, another area is the um, financial sector, uh, which is mainly uh, privatized, except the, the central bank, which has a supervisory responsibility. Um, so yes, the, the private sector is booming in, in Somaliland. Um, Somaliland's reconstruction has mainly been done by, uh, by the private sector. And our diaspora uh, in the United States of America, in, in Britain, in many other European and Arab states have heavily invested in our country. Uh, so yes, the, the private sector is, is working for us and that provides an opportunity to link up with international investors. Mr. Minister, uh, Dan Fisk with IRI. Again, thank you for, for joining us and being here. It would seem to me that under the standards of customary international law, small land meets the standards of statehood, of sovereignty. Would you again uh, go through your understanding of why, what you've been told by the U.S. government, why the U.S. government is not recognizing small land as an independent state? I fully agree with you. Uh, Somaliland satisfies all the conditions and criteria you would have, you would think, um, as being a criteria for a statehood. Uh, we have a, a permanent population. We have around four, coming up four million uh, people. There are more than six, seven African countries that have got less population than Somaliland. We have a territory, a permanent territory that's much greater than, than half a dozen of African states, including our neighbor Djibouti and many other states. Um, we have potentially uh, 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 economic sustainability for our country. In fact, we provide opportunity for a, for a global or regional economic um, uh, facilities like Bebra port, which can serve for Ethiopia, 85 million people landlocked with a very ambitious development and economic plan actively looking for a port we can provide and therefore we can act and, 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 and be a bridge for economic development for the whole region. 
all sorts of reasons why Somaliland should be recognized are there. Um, if you, n n don't forget about the stability we provide in the region, the democratic values and, and systems we have, um, which is all what the United States bridges and other uh, Western countries also would like to see happening in many, many developing countries. The official um, uh, um, uh, reason that's often provided by, uh, or an argument if you like, provided by the West, not, not necessarily only the United States of America, is that the issue of recognition uh, is actually for the African uh, Union or African states, if you like, to take, to take on. Um, we can understand that um, um, Somalia is part of Africa and the African Union should have an opinion on, on, on our situation. But we see the hypocrisy there. We, we have seen many examples where uh, Western countries, um, um, including uh, USA, have taken an active role in embracing new nation states. Um, South Sudan is, is one, of, um, um, one of those countries. Um, in fact, the African Union opposed it actively to the uh, independence of South Sudan. It is other countries that have uh, promoted the idea of South Sudan, which, which so we supported it. It is a self-determination of the people of Southern Sudan that have been respected. And we think that our self-determination should, should also be respected by, by America, by other peace-loving and democracy-loving countries. Um, we think that there is a lot of um, uh, things that America and other countries can do, uh, and we are talking. We we're still talking to the government of uh, of, of of America and other governments, and, and trying to convince our argument. Thank you. Can I do a follow up? Sure. sure. Yeah. Ms. Minister, I would just promise a, a follow up though. Please. What is, from your perspective, the downside, or is there a downside, should the United States or another Western country, in other words, a not an African country, be the first, one of the first to recognize Somalia? And in the end, does it make any difference? Don't you just need someone to recognize you? Um, honestly, I can't think of any, um, any downside for, for the United States government's decision to recognize uh, Somaliland. I, I think that will be an encouraging, that will be, um, that will send a, a clear message out there to the international community, to Somalia, to everyone, that the United States cares about good behavior, cares about stability and peace, cares about democracy, cares about uh, the uh, um, people who are committed to the war against terror, which is a common international problem. Uh, and I think that other countries will follow suit. Um, I think South Sudan has been supported by big countries, and there wasn't any downside uh, I can think of. Uh, it, it, a lot of African states came to the inauguration of Africa of, of Saudi, South Sudan's independence on, on, on the 7th of July. My president and myself uh, have had the privilege of witnessing that historic moment in South Sudan. And I have to say, a lot of uh, visitors have embraced us and they welcomed us and they were wishing us that um, they wish us that we were going to be the next country. Our flag has been raised, which we're very happy with that for the first time in, on, in a country that's not Somaliland. That shows the attitude of African states and some other countries have moved on. Um, I can't think of any downside. I think it will be only positive um, results of, of that decision. Mr. Omar, uh, Steve Evans from the Marine Corps University Press. Uh, just a quick question on, uh, well, first a comment. I, I don't think the United States or the UK should wait for the AU. I mean, we've been polite. They've had their chance. If they didn't want to avail themselves of it, then you know, we should just go ahead and recognize you. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the, the recent deal that uh, Somaliland affected with, uh, uh, with China in, in regard to the uh, the port, uh, improving the port of uh, Burra? Yes, certainly. Um, this specific um, um, initiative was as a result of an approach we have received from um, a, a Chinese uh, investor. Um, a Chinese, that Chinese investor has uh, struck a deal with the Ethiopian government uh, about um, um, 
producing uh, a natural gas and, and they start thinking about because Ethiopia is a landlocked country they, 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 they wanted to have a port where those resources can be uh, exported internationally. Um, they also uh, needed a, 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 a factory which can uh, transform a natural gas into a liquid gas, which will be an end product for, 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 uh, for export. And, and Bebra is the closest port to Ethiopia. Uh, at the moment, Ethiopian government uh, and Ethiopian business community make use of Djibouti port which I think they will continue because they have this massive country, they have a very ambitious uh, development plan, they want, Ethiopia wants to become a middle income in 10 years time, that's their ambition, I think they, they would need more ports, Djibouti, Somaliland and other ports. And then they, they, the Chinese have approached us and they want us to see whether we can accommodate uh, for that purpose. Uh, and we in, we started talking to them. So the, the, there is no deal done yet. We we started. This is an initial talks about how we can make um, a, a deal. So we we went to uh, China and we have start talking about them. Obviously, we will be thinking about the the, the financial terms, the legal the legal uh, terms, the technical aspects. We are taking all those advice at the moment, but we are interested in in embracing international investments, whether it comes from China or from the U.S. Uh, or from Arab states, um, it, it doesn't matter. We want to have uh, an international investors interested in, in our country. That will help us to produce, to provide jobs. That will help us to take our profile higher than it is now. And we think it will encourage other investors and other people to come to Somalia. So yes, we, we are excited about that um, process. And we, we hope that will um, produce some good results. Let me just comment on something. Um, I, this is virtually the same response the U.S. government gave when Minister Sommeter came here in 1992 to talk to the Hank Cohen and the State Department about the issue of recognition. Part of the reason that I wrote that article was because I didn't think our arguments were getting an audience. Uh, it's unfortunate that the State Department hasn't moved appreciably beyond a point of 20 years ago, virtually, on this position. And I'm, I'm sad that we haven't had more success in getting the State Department to be bolder on the recognition issue. I think there is an important difference between South Sudan and Sudan because it was the comprehensive peace agreement process. And one of the arguments that works against you is there's nothing there on the other side to negotiate with that if two willing and able partners were able to negotiate a dissolution of their union, then that would, nobody would have a problem with that. The problem is there's nothing to negotiate with on the other side. Um, item three that, that I worry about, in fact, on my way over here, I had a word with David Shin. David is a uh, professor at George Washington, and as you know, was ambassador to Ethiopia. And um, his comment was on meeting you, and sorry that he couldn't be here, but he echoed the recent press release about, well, if El Shabaab withdraws from Somalia, then that vacuum will be filled again with warlords and the clan structures that they manipulate to create the darkness that has governed Somalia for a long time. And there's a fear among the learned uh, in this community or in, within Washington that fear the, a repeat, if you would, of the horrors of the early 90s. And then lastly, as a comment, and I know that you've had this discussion, whenever I talk to the oil companies that have declared force majeure on their properties in Somalia, Somaliland, uh, they worry, other, notwithstanding the border issue with Puntland, which as you know, colors some of those properties, is that even if we were to go back in there, we would never be able to get insurance coverage on our, you know, on our, on our operations. And secondly, what would, prevent another government from trying to somehow renegotiate these rights. And then, you know, uh, thirdly, if we brought in a partner, what would the partner say? Because they might eventually be subject to a suit by the original holder. I mean, there's lots of complications here on the oil, which I'm, I'm, I get frustrated by, as I'm sure you do. So those are just some, some observations which you, you don't have to respond to. No, no. It's... Absolutely, I agree with you. And um, just the point, if I can pick up the point of David, David Sheen about, about the war laws coming. It has happened last week. The Al-Shabaab has vacated many space within Mogadishu. 
um, that space has been, well, a couple of spaces have been taken already by warlords. Warlords are not in favor of peace and stability and security, and they don't want the TFG to succeed. So the TFG, um, it is very clear that they are so weak that they can't even capitalize on on the recent achievements on the ground. So that that's absolutely his Jeff Sheen's assessment it has already happened. I mean we we're seeing, and your comments on the CBA. Yeah, that's right. The um, one of the key um, objectives for the comprehensive peace agreement in Sudan was to make unity attractive first in six years. Uh, and if that's not, if, if it doesn't become attractive, then it provided an opportunity for the people in South Sudan to have a referendum on whether they want to go alone. Um, we think that Somaliland has been uh, in a unity with Somalia for, from 1960 till 1990, which is 30 years. So we have given a unity, we have tried to make unity attractive. We sacrificed it a lot. It didn't become attractive. It became destructive. Um, and then we, what, what we are saying now is, and we have a referendum in 2001 in Somaliland in which people were asking, do we really want to go alone or do we still want to be? And overwhelmingly, the people in Somaliland said, no, we want to go alone. We want to be independent. So yes, I think Somaliland has been, has had our own way of CBA. Um, and, and there is no a, a country like North Sudan that we can talk to and negotiate about our exit because of the squabbles, because of the divisions, because of the different groups, Al-Shabaab, um, uh, the TFG, the warlords are now coming, so many groups. You cannot pick and choose a, a group. That's what I want just to, as a comment on that. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, if I can venture uh, both a comment and then a follow with a question. Yes. I think one of the, uh, I, I've, having long been an advocate, as many in this room know, for Somaliland, I'm now convinced that Part of the problem that Somaliland has is you're too good. Uh, you don't present problems. Uh, you keep your 500 miles of coast free of piracy, so we don't need to patrol there uh, to keep pirates away. Uh, you're stable enough that we ship prisoners from Guantanamo to you because we wouldn't dare ship them to Mogadishu, and you, the former government, uh, uh, agreed to take these people. Uh, when we couldn't find anywhere else to take them. Uh, you, don't, you don't attack your neighbors. Uh, uh, in effect, you do everything right so that you can be ignored. It's the squeaky wheel. Uh, it reminds you that, you know, the, I often think maybe Somaliland's uh, salvation might be that movie, you know, the mouse that roared. Maybe if you would declare war on us and then we'll <laughs> defeat you in five minutes and then, then re proceed to rebuild. But uh, m more, more seriously, uh, I think one of the problems, actually, that Somaliland does face in this town and many other capitals is that people presume that since you've been so good for all 20 years now, you will all, things will always be the same, so we can take you for granted. We'll worry about the people in Mogadishu, since we're going to give them another year. You know, the audits reveal that they stole 96% of their bilateral aid the last two years, so we're going to give them another year to improve upon that record, so if you improve a greater efficiency. Uh, you know, maybe, could you comment on that? If we continue, the international community continues to ignore Somaliland, in the worst case scenario, which I certainly hope doesn't come to pass, that we continue to ignore, will things always remain the same? My suspicion is they won't, and that uh, we're making a major mistake in the international co community by simply say, taking you for granted for 20 years and thinking it will always be the same. Absolutely, Peter. I, I agree with you. In fact, one of the key ideas I'm, 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 I'm going to share or have been sharing uh, with Westerners here in, in, in the U.S. is you cannot take Somalian stability for granted. Um, we have been uh, working on stability and security and democracy for, ten, for over 20 years. Um, that's because we are fully committed into um, promoting our position. Um, but we were not going to be um, able to sustain those, those achievements alone. I think those achievements would have to be recognized and, and supported and defended. 
um, I don't think we will be able to do that alone. So this is a clear um, choice for the international community. Um, we understand the focus on Mogadishu, um, but we don't think that has to be uh, uh, used as an excuse of ignoring Somaliland stability and security and democracy. So I agree with Peter. Oh, we cannot guarantee. I think this, this, is, this is a message that we are sending out to the international community, that we need to be taken serious, we need to be supported, and we need to be engaged and acknowledged. Um, the question about the uh, Somaliland being too nice, it's not a joke. I, I was told by the African Union uh, that um, we cannot case, we cannot take your case to the Peace and Security Council in the African Union because you are not in war at war with anyone. Um, Somaliland has no int uh, intention, by the way, to cause trouble with anyone. <laughs> uh, so that, that's not what uh, I think. Advice for giving that. That's not what we are aiming to do. But th it was given in a, in, a, in a conference like this that we are too nice. Um, but we think that behavior has to be uh, acknowledged. We feel that it has to be rewarded by both the African Union but also by the Security Council. If I can just follow up, just for you. Uh, you're asking for engagement. As you have meetings around town, I know I realize this is your first visit as foreign minister uh, uh, to the Washington. What specific items, if there were two or three items that you would like to have from the United States in concrete uh, terms, other than recognition, which unfortunately I don't think is going to come immediately, what are the what are you asking for? What can we deliver uh, realistically? I think one of the uh um, um, concrete uh, issues which I think can be easily delivered uh, is the the Security Council gets regular reports on so, on Somalia. In, in fact, uh, in, in a two days time, the SRSG, the, Secret the special representative of the, Sec of the Secretary General uh, for Somalia, um, is will be delivering a speech or a report um, for the Security Council uh, members. Often in those repeats, Somaliland doesn't get mentioned. Yet the UN Security Council thinks Somalia is one. They, they, they tend to believe that there is, a, they believe the territorial integrity of Somalia. Uh, they acknowledge our, our, our progress and stability. But in those reports, we don't get mentioned. We are uh, asking the United States government and other friendly uh, other countries to ensure that Somaliland's progress, stability, um, democracy, ambitions, and plans, and the role that we can take in the, in the region has to be reported on on a regular basis, in the way that Somalia is being uh, gets reported uh, for the Security Council. So that's uh, one one idea that we want to share with with our friends and with with the United States government. Um, that's one thing. The other thing uh, we would like to talk about is if the international community continues asks us, um, why don't you? Um, uh, talk to, to the TFG. Can you help? We would like to help, but we would like to be uh, to be able to access to an international and regional conferences where the issue of the region, including Somalia, it, it gets discussed. So we would like the United States of government to help us to become a partner to the international contact group, for example. It's a group of countries led by, I think, the um, uh, U.S. is one of the countries that leads that process to, to, to engage us. So we need to access international forums. We need to be invited for the U.N. Security Council briefings. So we will come and talk about Somaliland's progress and the role we can take in the regional security. Um, another issue is about piracy. Uh, piracy, even though we don't produce pirates in, in Somaliland, uh, we have been affected. Uh, by, by, by the problem as a, as a result of that. Where the United States we will, uh, government can engage us and think creatively with us about ways in which we can help America and other countries, but also help ourselves um, in reducing the risk posed by, by piracy in the region. So these are one of the ideas we would like to share with America. Thank you, Ed Allen, IBTCI. Obvious, well, to me, obviously, the dual track initiative has represented an important step forward. In what ways can the dual track be strengthened to benefit people who have been trying to live peacefully and to advance their own development? Um, as I said, uh, dual track policy um, offers 
um, an, a, a new opportunity for, for Somaliland, but also uh, stable um, areas in, in, in Somalia. Um, but I think if the dual track, uh, dual track policy would have meant an increased U.S. aid assistant uh, to Somaliland, um, and if that assistant uh, would be based on on, on a bilateral uh, assistant, um, in a way that the Somaliland, I, I don't mean a budget support, uh, uh, cash coming from the USAID and coming into, uh, going into the, the budget of Somaliland government, but if there were uh, trust funds uh, where those money um, um, put, is put on and, and Somaliland government would have uh, a role to play in deciding uh, which areas uh, the, those money is going to be spent on and which sectors those money is going to be spent. I think that would have been uh, a good progress and a way forward for Somalia. Another issue would be the security. Um, we are expected to fight against piracy. We are expected to fight against uh, terrorists in the region. But we are not allowed to develop our security sector. We don't actually share a lot of intelligence and, and information with, with America, with other countries. I hope that the dual track uh, approach would facilitate those, those areas of cooperation. It would help us to train and develop our security sector, military and police. It will help us to uh, get uh, ships and boats in order to fight against uh, pirates. And it will help, uh, help us to have, um, uh, uh, to have uh, some uh, military stuff that we can bring in into Somalia in order to defend ourselves against terrorists. Dr. Amor, uh, Steve Evans again from uh, Marine Corps University Press. Uh, to, to, to one comment on the terminology, though. I guess it's part of just the way the general population sees Somalia. I mean, n no one refers to the Soviet Union anymore. No one re refers to Yugoslavia, which broke up at the, at the same time that Somalia did. So, I mean, I, I don't know what you can do about that, but... I mean, you have three successor states, Somaliland, Puntland, and South Central Somalia. So I don't know if, if you can, as part of the dual track policy, insist that we call you Somaliland. But uh, in any event, uh, my question is, uh, as part of the dual track policy, um, do you have any interaction whatsoever with the uh, combined joint task force, Horn of Africa, that's in uh, Djibouti? Uh, do, I mean, do they offer at least training of forces or, or anything they're, they're they're right next door and uh, it's a short trip i think the short, short answer is, is 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 no we don't have that um cooperation at all um uh, i know the um the pentagon is actually in favor of of working with with uh, with somaliland um, not an official document, but oh, I'm afraid of that. Um, but I think it's the, it's the State Department that's standing in the way, um, if I'm honest. But we, we need to talk about that. But we don't have that cooperation at the moment, no. One question um, related to the Puntland um, South Central or TFG issue. I mean, your aspirations are, are independence, your aspirations are for recognition, um, but without the TFG or something that's, that will come up, come of the TFG or something in the future, and Puntland, I mean, would you be encouraged to have more uh, official contact with each of those entities? Would you would would your government welcome more official um, meetings and co co you know cooperation on a on a regular basis? I mean, you're talking about being included in, in more of the conversation. Obviously, the TFG is very much included in, in the conversation since they're the official entity. Um, I mean, would you welcome more of the the official um, inclusion um, of of meetings? with the TFG and, and Puntland? Um, ideally, we would like to have a, um, a, a, a more cooperation with, with the TFG and, and Puntland. By the way, Puntland is not seeking for um, independence. They, it is it's a region 
which is part of Somalia. They see their future within the Somali political configuration. Um, we do have actually a, co um, uh, a cooperation at the moment with TFG uh, in a number of issues. One of the uh, issues is Kampala process. We all put Somaliland and Somalia are part of the Kampala process. Kampala process is a, is a regional framework uh, whereby experiences and policies about anti-piracy activities are shared. And, and those processes is, is led by Britain uh, and, and other uh, countries. And we, we come, you know, the Somaliland uh, ministers and our officers regularly attend the Kampala process and, and TFG comes as well. So we have a, um, that level of cooperation. Um, but I think that's it. But we have an, uh, an ideas um, about how we can cooperate with TFG in the future about trade relationships. We would like to, to have a tariff uh, set with, with the TFG in order to promote um, movement of trade and, and, and people. But it's very difficult. The TFG has no control on Somalia. They don't control beyond Mogadishu. I mean, they are controlling now Mogadishu for the first time in many, many years. So that's not possible, but we would like to cooperate with the TFG uh, a lot more than that. An interesting uh, irony in all this is that although we, uh, as the United States government, d do a lot of engagement with the TFG, our legal position as the United States government is we don't recognize them as the government of Somalia. Uh, you know, that's, you know, and, and we have that in plain black letter now, finally, from uh, when she was Solicitor General, Elaine Kagan, and uh, Professor Harold Coe, the legal position of the U.S. is no one is sovereign, but we'll still talk more to one another. So we're in a policy bind, a bind there that I think we need to sort out in, internally to move to a, to a, a better place. Uh, I think if there are no other questions, uh, thank the minister for an extraordinary uh, openness and willingness to engage everyone here. I think uh, everyone comes away uh, knowing more about Somaliland, knowing about its contributions to the region and, uh, and to the uh, uh, dynamics. And hopefully the, sometime in the future we'll have you back again and hopefully uh, in a, at least a greater level of engagement uh, has carried out, and hopefully that some of that begins here. So thank you again for your time and for your attention. Thank you very much.